Okay, the first item is questions to the First Minister, and the first question is from Heaven David. Will the First Minister make a statement on the gradual reopening of the small business sector in Wales following the COVID-19 lockdown? Uh, sorry, thank Kevin David for that question. The reopening of the whole business sector in Wales has been carried out in consultation with businesses, representative bodies and trades unions to ensure that our approach to reopening is safe, proportionate and fair to businesses, workers and to customers. I announced further lockdown easing measures and a supporting timetable on Friday of last week. As uh, you can imagine, First Minister, Fridays are very busy days, uh, both on my Facebook page and by email, where I've got questions about specific circumstances. Um, I've had many questions, but I've picked two of the most frequently asked. Uh, the first of those is regarding the uh, uh, ability for driving instructors to offer lessons. When will driving instructors be able to offer lessons, and by extension, when will test centres then be able to open. And the other most frequently asked question is children's play centres. When will children's play centres be able to open? And that includes uh, th such things as soft play. Uh, well, sorry, uh, thank Kevin David for both of those uh, questions. I'm very pleased to be able to say, Chloe, that we have reached an agreement with the Driver and Vehicle Standards Agency. Very grateful for their cooperation on this matter and the discussions with them and the trade unions over the last week. Uh, as a result, I'm able to confirm today that we will introduce a phased restart in Wales with driver and rider instructions commencing on the 27th of July and tests, both uh, theor theory tests and practical tests, phased in from the 3rd of August onwards. And by doing it uh, in that way, we can be confident that the reopening of driving lessons and testing in Wales will be done safely for everyone concerned, including those taking lessons and those conducting testing. The guidance will be provided in this instance with by the DVSA, and they will set it out together with a more detailed timetable on their website uh, very shortly. Uh, as to children's play uh, centres, indoor children play centres, uh, there is no uh, time as yet identified for them to reopen. They will be part of the discussions that we committed to during this three weeks uh, with leisure centres and local authorities and as soon as we are safely re able to reopen those play centres indoors uh, then we will do so outdoor play areas of course able to reopen from July the 20th. Jonathan Saunders. Jatla with Borida. Um, First Minister, in, in reply to my questions last week you said that I had not grasped the practicalities of reopening hospitality businesses. So I ask you, what do you say to Sabir Hamed of the Blue Elephant Restaurant in Llandidno, who documents that this Welsh Labour government is creating an unfriendly environment for the nation's hospitality businesses, as you continue to prevent his company from safely reopening indoor trade? What do you say to Laurie and Paul, two local North Wales hoteliers, who tell me that your actions risk turning our seaside resorts into ghost towns, as they have received an unprecedented number of cancellations following your own announcement last week. What do you say to Go North Wales, who have written to you and state, after 20 years of owning hotels successful to a high standard, the Welsh Government are successfully brokers of cash, spirit and mind? First Minister, with projected turnover expected to be at 25% of pre-lockdown levels and the current uncertainty threatening up to 22% of jobs in this sector, is it not you that has failed to grasp the reality and situation that is facing our hospitality businesses? And when are you going to provide some guidance or just some information so that our hoteliers and our restaurants can actually get back to work? Dioch. Uh, well, the, the answer to those uh, questions is, is that I think people are better advised to focus on those things they can do rather than complain about the things that they can't. Because there is ample scope for all those businesses to now reopen in Wales, to reopen out of doors as from Monday of this week and, provided a success is made of that and coronavirus is still under control, to reopen indoors from the 3rd of August. Uh, I, the reports I have had from our hospitality and our tourism sector is that they have had a very good start indeed uh, to the reopening of the season with hundreds and hundreds of bookings being made 
uh, in Wales. Uh, and the sector, I think, those in the sector who are progressive and positive, look at the things that they are now able to do and make a success of those, uh, rather than writing letters complaining about the things uh, that they are unable to do. In that way, they will be able to make a success of their businesses and of the sector. Question die, Mike Hedges. Dior Flowers, will the First Minister make a statement on Welsh Government support for pro professional <coughs> sport? Uh, thank you, Mike Hedges, for that. Now, with our Economic Resilience Fund, has been open for applications from professional sports organisations, and over three quarters of a million pounds has been provided to the sector as a result. Uh, First Minister, thank you for your response. I, I want to stress the importance of professional sport. Since March, professional sport in Wales has either not been playing or been played without spectators. Professional sports clubs like the Ospreys and Swansea City Football Club are major employers in Swansea, as well as their importance as ambassadors for the area and the provision of entertainment. There is an urgent need for financial support for professional sport until spectators are allowed to return, unless we are facing the horrendous prospect of no professional sport below international level. What fi further financial support is the Welsh Government proposing to give to professional sport in Wales until spectators can return? Uh, well, so, uh, as I said, we have already provided significant financial uh, support to a number of professional sports organisations in Wales, uh, over three quarters of a million in total. I'm pleased to say that uh, some of those beneficiaries are directly in the members' own uh, area. Uh, and we have announced uh, a £8.5 million sports resilience fund, and £4.5 million of that is for national governing bodies, and that will be of assistance to the sector uh, as well. But uh, I want to agree with what Mike Hedges said about the importance of professional sport, uh, both as uh, significant employers uh, in parts of Wales, uh, but also the part that uh, watching and enjoying professional sport plays in the lives of so many uh, of our fellow citizens. When we will be in a position to return to spectators in large numbers at those events, uh, I think is to early, I'm afraid, to be able to say that. Uh, in the meantime, while professional sport played behind closed doors clearly uh, doesn't have the atmosphere and the attraction uh, that it would otherwise, it can, however, be done successfully. As someone who spent uh, most of the weekend listening to the Test match, uh, it was as gripping uh, as a spectator remotely as it would have been had the ground been full. Laura Ann Jones. Dear Clark, uh, First Minister, one way of supporting professional sport in Wales would be to relax the social distancing uh, rules and allow our Welsh stadiums to reopen. The Chief Executive of the English Rugby Football Union makes the point that reducing social distancing measures to one metre, which is the Welsh Health Organisation's recommendation and guidance, results in a capacity of 40,000 people in an 80,000 uh, thousand seater stadium, compared to less than 10,000 if two metres is adhered to. Given that the Welsh Rugby Union is facing forecast losses of some £107 million due to coronavirus, what discussions have you had with the WRU um, about introducing measures like relaxing the social distancing measures to one metre to enable Wales to play its home matches in Welsh grounds? Uh, well, so we've had a series of discussions with the WRU and I've been involved directly in some of those myself and we are providing significant assistance already to the Welsh Rugby Union and are in discussions with them about further assistance that we may be able to provide. Uh, the thought of 40,000 people uh, coming together in a mass event is certainly not consistent with the approach to tackling coronavirus that we have had here in Wales. The risks that that would pose to the health of those people attending uh, and to those people who would have to be employed in order to allow that to happen is simply not within the realms of what a sensible approach to dealing with this global pandemic would suggest. Questions now from the party leaders. First of all today, leader of Plaid Cymru, Adam Price. So, uh, last week, a study published by Oxford's uh, Leverhulme Centre for Demographic Science uh, found that face coverings are effective in reducing the spread of COVID-19 for the wearer and those around them. And this adds, uh, adds, of course, to a growing body of evidence uh, which supports the same conclusion. Uh, the study further noted that after the uh, World Health Organisation announced the pandemic in, in mid-March, uh, some 70 countries immediately uh, recommended the universal use of, of, of masks, 
To date, more than 120 nations now require uh, mask uh, wearing. That's more than 60 per cent of, uh, of the world. They're mandatory in Scotland, as we know, in shops. The same will be true in England uh, from the 24th of Ju July. The rather inexplicable delay, in my view. Uh, your, your careful approach uh, in terms of the easing of restrictions has served well uh, in many ways. But you now, uh, I think, risk treading the line between being too cautious and being too slow on, on this issue. Why is Wales lagging behind when so many other countries have acted so decisively? Uh, well, sorry, I just reject the language of lagging behind. We are doing the things that are right for Wales. That does not mean following anybody else just because they have done something that we have decided not to do. Uh, so if you would allow me, I just want to take a minute more than I normally would uh, to explain the Welsh Government's position on this issue, given that it is a matter of public interest. Uh, first of all, it's important to think of the context here. Uh, regulations require that any restriction on liberty of Welsh citizens has to be proportionate to the public health risk uh, that is faced. And what is the state of the virus here in Wales? Well, it is at its lowest ebb since the onset of the crisis. The positivity rate in the 7,000 tests a day that were carried out in Wales over the weekend was 0.25 per cent. One quarter of one per cent, 20 tests out of 7,000 returning as being positive. By contrast, the positivity rate in Blackburn, uh, where lockdown measures are being reintroduced, is 7 per cent, 30 times the rate uh, in Wales. And large parts of Wales didn't have a single positive case over the whole of last weekend. 14 of the 22 local authorities, from memory, without a single reported positive case. The proportionality test, is it proportionate to require every Welsh citizen going into a shop to wear a face covering when the virus is in such a low state of circulation here in Wales? Uh, then the issue of shops. Well, shops are different in Wales because our regulations are different. Uh, quite unlike across our border, we have had the two-metre social distancing rule in regulations, and it remains the default position here in Wales. A legal obligation on businesses to take all reasonable measures to ensure a two-metre distance. And since Monday, there are now new legal obligations on shops to take a further set of mitigating measures where a two-metre distance cannot be sustained and letters have gone to all the major supermarkets yesterday ensuring that they are aware of the law in Wales and their obligation to adhere to it. And then finally, Llywydd, is it unambiguously and clearly advantageous that access to shops should be denied to those wearing face coverings? Our Chief Medical Officer's advice has not changed. They have a marginal utility but they also have identifiable downsides. Some people behave more riskily because they are wearing a face covering. Some people can't wear face coverings, people with lung conditions, people with asthmatic conditions. Some people are disadvantaged when others wear face coverings, the visually impaired, people relying on lip reading. And once it's compulsory, it will have to be enforced. So shall we keep it all under review? I've asked for further advice, for example, on suggestions that supermarkets in tourist destinations have been crowded over this last weekend as populations in those areas increase. Mandatory use of face coverings as part of a local lockdown, should that become necessary, would certainly be part of a potential repertoire here in Wales. And if the prevalence of coronavirus in Wales were to rise, our advice would be revisited. In the meantime, the position in Wales is anybody going into a shop who wishes to wear a face mask is absolutely entitled to do so. Our advice is that if it's crowded, you should wear one. But should we make it mandatory in all the conditions that I've described? Should we trespass on people's liberty to that extent? We haven't reached that point in Wales. The, um, the University of Washington's Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation um, recently projected uh, the difference between universal use of face masks in the UK between now and uh, November would be uh, 20,000 additional deaths. Um, on a proportionate basis, that would, we would be talking about uh, around 1,000 deaths uh, potentially in Wales. As part of the review that he's referred to, would he specifically ask 
the technical advisory cell of the Chief Medical Officer to look at that study and uh, whether it does uh, uh, have uh, a, 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 um, it, a, 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 an evidential force which would suggest that we need to uh, change the policy and we need to change it uh, fast. Can I ask uh, the, the First Minister in relation to the care sector, uh, we've heard from the care for their, their, their expression of disappointment that they've not been given any assurances on whether weekly testing uh, for staff will uh, continue. Are you able uh, today, First Minister, to allay uh, the sector's concerns and announce your care home uh, testing strategy going forward? Well, so on uh, uh, Mr Price's first point, I've seen uh, that study and I'm very happy to ask the technical advisory group to look at it. Uh, at first reading, it does seem very implausible. Uh, we have managed in Wales to go for a position where we were reporting many tens of deaths every day to a position where there was no death at all reported in three or four days over the weekend. And during that period, face coverings were never compulsory at all. Uh, so how uh, it is plausibly argued that we would have a thousand extra deaths prevented simply by wearing face coverings? Uh, I, well, I, at first reading, I found that very difficult to understand and to see uh, the force of that argument, particularly when face coverings are nowhere near uh, as uh, a pro much of a protection to you as sustaining a two-metre social distance uh, and doing the other things that have a greater impact on people's chances of contracting uh, the virus. But our technical advisory group is there to review evidence. I'm very happy that it should uh, review that evidence uh, as well. Uh, this afternoon, uh, with my colleague Von Gethin will be answering a question. I understand on uh, care homes, he'll uh, be able to explain the results of the analysis that we've been carrying out uh, of the four weeks of weekly testing of care home staff, uh, testing that revealed a prevalence of coronavirus amongst care home staff at 0.1%, uh, one person in every thousand. Uh, so he will make a uh, he will set out his conclusions as to what that means for testing in the care home sector in the weeks to come this afternoon and what he will, and, uh, what he will have to say will be the result uh, of engagement directly with Care Forum Wales. Yeah, I think that the, the point in that study and indeed other scientists that have vigorously supported the use of face masks is, is as you change uh, the level of restrictions and you th therefore lead to more people being in more contact, having face covering is an additional measure which can then change uh, the number of cases and indeed the number of deaths. Um, can I just say, stay with the care sector? Um, if the COVID crisis has taught us anything, it's the value of, of that sector. Um, care workers have been at the forefront of the ba of battle against the virus, as we know. Um, their, their tireless efforts have been hampered uh, at times by the often disjointed dynamic between our health and care sectors and, and the fact that they're not fairly rewarded for their work. Isn't this uh, the time, uh, First Minister, as we begin to think about a post-COVID Wales for a national integrated health and care service free at the point of need that will synchronise our most vital public services and give care workers the pay rise and the pay structure they deserve by moving them onto NHS uh, pay scales. Nothing is stopping this from happening uh, from political will. Do you share it? Uh, well, Shavid, I understand the point that Adam Price made about the study. It's why I said in my original answer that I'd ask for further advice on uh, suggestions that supermarkets had become particularly crowded in some parts of Wales because if that were to be the case then the case for wearing of face coverings is strengthened in uh, in those contexts so I understand the point uh, that he made there. Uh, so with we have had a major program within the Welsh uh, government of paying for care uh, drawing on the work of Professor Jerry Holtham and the proposals that he uh, has made uh, and we will sharing many of the points that uh, Adam Price has made this morning about the value of the sector, the need to make sure that the people who work in it are properly regarded and uh, rewarded. We will use that work uh, to take policy forward in Wales. And we do very much need to see, Llywydd, uh, a policy conclusion from the UK government 
uh, the Dilnot review, now nearly a decade old, uh, and still nothing uh, to show for it, because anything we do in Wales will inevitably be affected by changes in the benefit system, uh, which Dilnot proposed, uh, and would have an impact on Welsh citizens as well. So a Wales alone solution uh, will not work because the uh, intersections with decisions made in non-devolved areas will be material and we will want to make sure that our uh, actions take full account of changes that are made across the border and we need to know what those changes are going to be. Paul Davis. Leader of the Conservatives, Paul David. Um, First Minister, from the uh, 6th of July, households in Wales have been permitted to join together to form an extended support bubble to enable families to reunite, meaning that people can form one extended household and meet indoors. That move was welcomed by many across Wales who, after months of being unable to see their loved ones, were finally able to spend some time with their families and with their friends. Given the pace in which so many changes are now being made, which now result in more and more people interacting with each other in outdoor and indoor spaces, perhaps it's time to consider the creation of further support bubbles. Therefore, First Minister, can you tell us what scientific evidence is the Welsh Government using to underpin its policy on social bubbles? And can you also tell us what consideration the Welsh Government has given to further relaxing restrictions on this specific matter? Uh, I, I believe that the evidence that we uh, are drawing on was set out in a technical advisory group paper that we published. Uh, I'll check whether, we, whether it is published. If it's not, I'm very happy to share the paper with the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, it's a detailed paper. It draws very much on experience in New Zealand uh, as the basis for the proposals we are following here uh, in Wales. Uh, we will uh, keep that uh, policy under review during the current three-week cycle, which we're already well into the first week uh, of it. Uh, we use the additional headroom we had during this three weeks to uh, attend to the urgent calls from the tourism industry and from hospitality uh, to reopen those businesses in Wales. And once we've taken those decisions, then the amount of headroom you have got left to do more in the space of uh, extended households or households coming together in the open air or indoors is inevitably limited. Provided we are in a position at the end of this three-week cycle that coronavirus in Wales is still under control to the extent that I've already described uh, this morning, there will be new possibilities. Uh, and using some of that headroom for further relaxation of the restrictions on family and friends meeting will definitely be part of that consideration. First Minister, thanks to the uh, people of Wales, significant progress has been made in limiting the spread of the virus in communities across Wales, which, of course, has allowed freedoms to have been relaxed in other areas. For example, a further set of coronavirus restrictions, which have also been lifted in Wales, as you've just said, is in relation to self-contained accommodation, such as holiday cottages and caravans reopening. Wales's hospitality businesses across the country have also started reopening this week in outdoor areas, and many are looking at ways in which they can continue to comply with government guidance when they reopen their internal spaces on the 3rd of August. Therefore, given the immediate need to support hospitality businesses here in Wales, can you tell us what specific package of support the Welsh Government will provide in the short term? And will you also be bringing forward a specific strategy for the hospitality sector for both the medium and long term to protect its sustainability and protect vital jobs? And what domestic tourism strategy is the Welsh Government developing so that we can maximise the amount of visitors spend and help support our tourism and hospita hospitality businesses at this time? Well, so with tens of millions of pounds of support has already been provided both to the tourism sector and separately and additionally uh, to the hospitality sector here uh, in Wales. Uh, and that's in addition to all the help that the sector has received from the UK government through the furlough uh, scheme, which has been very important indeed in both of those industries. Uh, and many, many further applications have been made to the phase two of the Economic Resilience uh, Fund, which closed on Friday of last week, uh, again from those sectors. So uh, the sectors have had very significant support from the UK government and from the Welsh uh, 
uh, government in recognition of the enormous impact that coronavirus has had on them. Uh, our strategy, uh, our immediate strategy, has focused very much on getting the sectors reopened and getting them reopened safely. Uh, and that remains our focus over the next few weeks because a success needs to be made of these first steps in order that we can build on them further and continue to reopen uh, the sector. And the resources of the Welsh Government, the staffing resources, our ability to engage directly with the sector has been very much focused on that strategy, getting these industries up and working uh, again. Once we manage to do that successfully, then of course we will continue to work, both with tourism and hospitality, together with them to shape a future through the rest of this year that builds on whatever success we can uh, achieve and allows them to go on earning a living in the way that they do, providing employment in the way uh, that they do and contributing in, to the Welsh economy in a very significant way. First Minister, the gradual reopening of the hospitality sector in Wales provides further opportunities for people to socially interact with members from outside their households. I recently met with local hospitality businesses to discuss the ongoing impact of COVID-19 and the Welsh Government's regulations. And the message was clear. This year, most hospitality businesses are simply focusing on survival. Therefore, as restrictions continue to ease, it will be crucial that we maximise the amount of spend locally in Wales. And I sincerely hope that the Welsh Government is refocusing its procurement practices to help our businesses recover. Wales's small and medium businesses need support now more than ever, and the Welsh Government must use any and all levers at its disposal to support businesses and champion local products and services. Therefore, First Minister, what new action is the Welsh Government taking in terms of its procurement practices to support Welsh businesses and help them recover? Could you also tell us what campaigning is the Welsh Government doing to encourage people to spend locally and support Welsh businesses to help rejuvenate local communities across the country? And given the measures introduced by other countries across the world to support businesses, what consideration has the Welsh Government given to bringing forward financial incentives, such as business rate relief, to support Welsh businesses to recover from this pandemic? Uh, well, so with business rate relief is practically universal uh, in these sectors at 100 per cent for the rest of this financial year. So there's nothing further we can do there because they're not paying any business rates at all. Uh, in terms of local spend and procurement, then the outstanding area in which we have been able to uh, achieve new ground in this uh, context is in PPE, uh, where many Welsh businesses uh, have answered the call that we made to help us to secure the necessary supplies of PPE for our health and social care sector. 215 million uh, items now uh, issued, Llywydd, a million items being issued every day, 91 million items to social care alone. And we wouldn't have been able to do that if we hadn't used our procurement uh, in order to encourage Welsh businesses to convert what they were previously doing into the production of face masks, uh, fluid-resistant gowns and other things which are now being supplied not just to Wales but to other parts of the United Kingdom uh, as well. And I think that is a very good example of how in a crisis people can act really quickly, incredibly positively. We've been so uh, grateful to what businesses in Wales have done uh, in this area. We want to do more of that, uh, of course. Uh, in terms of local spend, uh, then the fact that our stay local message in Wales wasn't lifted until uh, just about uh, a week or so ago means that people have indeed been spending locally in Wales during this pandemic because that's where their lives uh, have been uh, led. And I know that that by itself has managed to sustain a number of businesses who without that local support would not have been able to survive. And I agree with what Paul Davis said. Many businesses are indeed in survival mode at the moment. And our aim is to help them to survive so that when the better days uh, come, they will be there to continue their previous success. But that survival has only been possible in many contexts because people have stayed local, because they have spent local, and they've supported those local businesses. Rhyneth played Brexit.
leader of the Brexit Party, Mark Reckless. Uh, First Minister, you've overseen a significantly higher COVID-19 infection rate in Wales than in the rest of the United Kingdom, as well as a worse economic situation. Despite this, you found time to lambast the UK government over its Brexit responsibilities, twice using the crisis to demand they extend the transition period, as you've once again tried to block Brexit. Now we see your Minister for Covid Economic Recovery turn his focus to attacking the UK Government over the Gender Recognition Act. He attacks it for failing formally to respond to a Gender Recognition Act consultation and we're told for repeatedly delaying publication of the review. Is it possible that the UK Government has had other priorities? Uh, so with, uh, I'll try and pick something out of the, the question if I can. Um, <laughs> Brexit certainly hasn't uh, gone away and Brexit is going to happen. Uh, all we are focused on is trying to help it to happen in a way that does not add a further layer of economic distress on companies in Wales who are already struggling, as Paul Davis said, to deal with the consequences of a global pandemic. Uh, that's all we're asking. It's simply that uh, a disaster that nobody could have uh, prevented is not made even worse by a disaster that is eminently preventable by the simple and straightforward uh, course of action of asking for a short extension to the transition period to take account of the fact that, as the member just said, People have been very busy doing other things. Uh, if that applies to the Gender Recognition Act, then surely it applies even more uh, to a sensible approach to Brexit. And as far as the Gender Recognition Act review is concerned, all we are asking the UK Government to do is to do what they've said they would do, nothing else. Uh, they have carried out the review, they have promised to publish it, they have not done so. All we're asking is that they do what they said they would. In many areas, First Minister, you've understandably made commitments as a government which it has not um, been possible to carry through or which have had to be delayed because of the COVID crisis. I, I merely suggest that you um, allow and accept that the similar pressures affect the UK government. Wales voted for Brexit. You put forward your proposals on the area at the general election. Uh, there's now a Conservative government of majority of 80, surely you should accept that democratic decision. We have certain areas that are devolved to Wales, certain areas that are reserved. But again and again, we see the Welsh Government failing to respect that settlement, failing to respect reserved powers. On gender recognition, I believe there are some difficult and challenging issues around balancing rights. But surely the way to deal with it for a reserved issue is to work within the framework set by UK government, not declare UDI, instead focus on the devolved powers you have and making them work properly. My concern with this, as so many others, is you lambast the UK government over its exercise of reserve powers, yet complain when anyone criticises you in any way about you, what you do in a devolved context. You're always devol demanding more and more devolved powers, yet substantial numbers of pe people in Wales voted against devolution. Last time, last time, those who supported it did so on the basis of an assurance on the ballot paper that the Assembly cannot make laws on tax, whatever the result of this vote. Yet you, in cahoots with the Conservatives, broke that promise and income tax powers were devolved without the promised further referendum. Isn't that why devolution in Wales is not settled, along with your refusal to respect reserved powers and the fact that however much is devolved, it is never enough for politicians here? Uh, well, uh, Shawith, as I recall, as I recall, and I, I may be wrong because it's not always easy to keep up, uh, that the member was a Conservative MP at the time that the Conservative Party broke what it had promised people in Wales about a referendum. He was a Conservative MP. He voted for the promise that was broken, and then he comes here to complain about it. There isn't a shred of credibility 
in what the member has to say. Uh, so it, I believe in assertive devolution, uh, and that's the policy that this government will pursue. Question three, Carwyn Jones. Question three, Carwyn Jones. Oh. <laughs> Wake up. We, we well, yeah, I, 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 <laughs> I thought I heard Caroline just forgive me. Uh, <laughs> no, nah, Caroline Jones. Will the First Minister outline what financial support is available from the Welsh Government to businesses in Wales? Uh, thank uh, Caroline Jones for that question. So, with our 1.7 billion business support package, which is equivalent to 2.6 per cent of our GVA, complements other UK schemes and means that companies in Wales have access to the most generous offer of help anywhere in the United Kingdom during the coronavirus crisis. Thank you, uh, First Minister. Many businesses have contacted my constituency office to express their uh, gratitude at the support that they've received from the Welsh Government and from the UK Government. There are still, however, some businesses who are concerned that they may not be able to access the support that they need, mainly micro-businesses. Uh, would the First Minister then give an assurance that uh, the support mechanisms will be kept under constant review to make sure that as much support as possible is available to as many businesses as possible? Uh, so I thank uh, Karen Jones for that supplementary question and as I've said previously in the Assembly in the Senate uh, we have tried to use our funds to complement the help that has been available through the UK uh, government schemes and micro businesses are one of those areas that we have focused uh, on as a result. My colleague Ken uh, Skates launched phase two of the Economic Resilience Fund so with, as I mentioned, £100 million further to assist Welsh businesses. And I know that uh, uh, my colleague Karen Jones will be interested to know that when the fund closed for applications on Friday of last week, the micro fund had received 5,524 applications. Uh, and that if you total those applications up, uh, that would have resulted in £54.2 million being applied for from the micro fund. The micro sole trader fund received 430, 453 applications uh, in the sum of 4.4 uh, million. Uh, and I was very uh, pleased myself to be able to launch the Startup Business Fund as part of phase two of the Economic Resilience Fund. A five million pounds fund could help up to 2,000 businesses to the tune of 2,500 uh, pounds each. And all of those are aimed exactly at the sorts of businesses that Carolyn Jones has mentioned uh, this afternoon, this morning, so and I think uh, are examples of the way in which we have tried to use our money to fill those gaps and to focus on those businesses who have slipped through the net uh, of the large uh, schemes that the UK, UK government has put uh, in place and to use our money to the best effect. Andrew R.T. Davis. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Um, First Minister, what would be devastating economically would be the need for either a second lockdown or a localised lockdown. And one of the key measures that you've put in place is trace it, test and tracing. Your figures for returning the results from test and tracing are getting worse. The, what, the figures for 24-hour delivery are under 50% response rate. And for 48 hours, only 66% of tests are returned to the people who put themselves up for the test. How are you going to improve these figures to get close to the 90% that most experts believe provides a, an effective testing structure that would protect us economically and also health? Well, Shawid, I agree with Andrew R.T. Davis that avoiding a second wave of coronavirus later this year is very important indeed to the health of businesses as well as to health of the population. And it's why we have taken the approach we have here in Wales, and we are seeing in other parts of the world just how easily it is possible to uh, move from a position of relative security to one where lockdown measures do have to be reimposed. So I agree with his point there. Uh, our TTP system does need to return uh, more tests more quickly, uh, and we are working with the system for that to happen. We would have uh, had better results at the end of last week if it hadn't been for the fact that one of the lighthouse labs that we are now using in greater uh, numbers faced a series of difficulties last week which meant that their ability to return tests in 24 hours uh, was compromised by the challenges that they face. We are arranging for 
a, an enhanced courier service to make sure that tests are taken from the testing site to the laboratory uh, more quickly and more regularly uh, during the day. We are exploring with our Welsh laboratories ways in which they can uh, turn those tests around uh, more quickly. Uh, in the meantime, the TTP system as a whole uh, is, I'm pleased to say, working uh, very well. 82% uh, of positive cases identified between the 28th of June and the 4th of July were successfully contacted, and 87% of over 1,150 close contacts have been successfully uh, followed up. And those figures compare very favourably uh, with levels of successful follow-up that are being achieved elsewhere. Thank you, Llywydd. Of course, a number of rural businesses over the years have been receiving business support through the RDP, for example, and we saw a recent report from Audit Wales that had highlighted maladministration by the Welsh Government on certain aspects of that, worth £53 million had been distributed in a way that didn't have measures in place to secure value for money, and we received confirmation in the Sustainable Development Committee that there would be disallowance and that there were negotiations now between the European Commission and the Welsh Government to recoup some, if not all, of those funds. Would you now accept that it's time for us to have a full review of the way the RDP in Wales had been administered and has been used so that we can be confident that we have had the value for money that we should have had for this investment, particularly given that your Government now intends to use the RDP model and the way that's implemented as the basis for the plans that you're bringing forward for supporting agriculture and sustainable land management for the future. It's important that we learn lessons. Of course, it's important that we do learn lessons and the with the RDP, it's important that we look into what we're doing on both the European and local level. But it's important to be clear about what Audit Wales said. Well, the processes didn't guarantee that value for money had been achieved, and we've improved those processes since. What they didn't say was that the schemes that were funded weren't value for money because they never looked at the schemes at all. They simply looked at the process by which the schemes were funded. But a number of the schemes that they looked at have gone on to be award-winning schemes here in Wales and beyond Wales as well. So it was never, the, the report never says at all that the schemes themselves did not deliver value for money. They simply said that the process by which they were funded didn't give you a guarantee that the money had been spent uh, in that way, and that's something we do need to attend to. Uh, our focus, Llywydd, uh, as well as learning lessons, uh, is on trying to make sure that we have equivalent funding in the future to go on making those investments in the rural economy that the RDP has allowed us to make. And we're nowhere near having those guarantees from the UK government. Uh, and it's not long now before that funding begins to run out. Question Pedwar Dyloid. Question for Dyloid. First Minister made of the importance of local radio stations in Wales. Uh, thank Dr Lloyd for that. The Welsh Government recognises the importance of local radio stations in ensuring that the people of Wales have access to vital local news and information, which has been crucial during the COVID-19 pandemic. First Minister, this week saw the final ever Sunday hotline presented by Kev Johns on Swansea Sound. The hotline had run for decades and was well valued by local residents, providing a unique opportunity for people to raise local issues of concern and to question local politicians. Um, sadly, the station will leave the airwaves in September as part of a rebranding exercise. Now, there are more than enough UK-wide or regional networks all reporting the same news with the same presenters. What we are lacking is truly local radio, which reflect local people's lives. Do you therefore agree that one way of reversing this loss is to devolve broadcasting to this parliament? and to develop our own local commercial radio station footprint here in Wales. Uh, I agree with the points that the member has made about the importance of local broadcasting. 
Uh, I appeared on the Kev Johns uh, programme myself once in the company of my colleague uh, Mike Hedges, and a, and a very good experience uh, it was. A very skilful broadcaster with a real rapport uh, with his local uh, audience, and very well able to uh, convey the things that were of most concern uh, to them. My understanding, Chloe, is, is that though Swansea Sound will no longer operate in its name, uh, the purchaser of the wireless group's local radio stations has not asked Ofcom uh, for any change in the remit uh, of that station. It will therefore be required, when it does reopen, to fulfil the original format. Uh, and that includes commitments relating to Welsh language programming and local news and information. And we will certainly be uh, expecting Ofcom to ensure that uh, those commitments are delivered in the way that the new uh, station will operate, both for the benefit of Swansea residents and for those uh, who surround that area. Uh, the wider uh, debate, Llywydd, uh, is one we've had uh, many times here uh, on the floor of the Senedd and in Senedd uh, committees. Uh, our immediate focus is on making sure, as I say, that the obligations on the new owner to deliver a local service that successfully reflects the unique language, culture uh, and concerns of the communities that, that sa the station serves, that those commitments are delivered upon. Uh, and we will be focusing on that, as I say, directly in communication with Ofcom itself. David Melding. First Minister, we've seen the great benefit of regional, local and indeed community radio during this crisis. In great comfort to many people as they have uh, had to spend so much time at home with local news and features. And I just wonder if you can do more to use procurement, uh, help with training grants, and also uh, our public health uh, messages, and putting as many as possible through these routes. At least the Welsh Government, in the way it acts economically, can help these vital networks. So as I agree with all of those uh, points, we've used our advertising budget during the coronavirus uh, crisis directly to place advertising with local radios, including uh, Swansea Sound. Uh, we've done our best to offer as much access to those local uh, outlets as possible so that they can use their platforms to make sure that people have the information that they need in the daily press conferences uh, that we have been holding. Uh, we've had 12 local broadcasters regularly taking place, again including Swansea Sound, and I myself have given interviews to 20 different local radio and local newspapers over the last three months, again just to make sure that they have direct access to the Welsh Government so we can support them in the work that uh, they do. We've repurposed our independent community journalism uh, fund and seven publications in Wales have shared in £76,500 of funding to support them in the financial challenges they face. And we have helped two stations to have access to Ofcom's 400000 community radio fund. Uh, Ofcom intend to launch quite soon, uh, the second iteration of that fund, and the Welsh Government will work with community radio stations in Wales to make sure that they have the best chance of securing funding from that source as well. So I agree with uh, David Melding about the importance of the things that we can do to help, and I hope that I've been able to demonstrate that in all the different things we're able to do, we have very much had local print and broadcasting outlets at the forefront of our thinking during the pandemic. Question Pimp, David Rees. What actions is the Welsh Government taking to support the manufacturing sector in Wales? Uh, so the Welsh Government's manufacturing manifesto was due to be published on the 2nd of April. Uh, while formal consultation has not been possible because of the coronavirus crisis, the themes of the manifesto, skills, infrastructure, research and leadership, for example, continue to shape our support for the sector. Well, thank you for that answer, First Minister, and I look forward to the publication of the manifesto because it is critical. Uh, Welsh manufacturing has been the bedrock of, many of our, much of our economy over the years and actually over the centuries, and it's important. We need to keep that going. We have seen losses in Airbus, GE, 
manufacturing has been hit by COVID very severely. Now, the UK government seems to have failed to actually consider manufacturing and is not given the support it should be given. But this Welsh government needs to give that support to ensure that it continues to thrive throughout the years ahead of us. Can you give me guarantees that the Welsh government will continue to support manufacturing, particularly in areas which have faced difficulties, and I'll include steel in that area, as well as the aviation sector, so that we can continue to have the highly skilled, well-paid jobs in Wales, which they've always supported? I'm very happy indeed to provide that assurance to David Rees. He's right. 10.7% uh, of Welsh employment takes place in the manufacturing sector, compared to 79 of the UK uh, employment in that sector. So it's obviously of much greater importance to us here in Wales, and particularly to communities of the sort that David Riso regularly speaks up for here on the floor of the Senate. Uh, now, you know, I want to recognise where the UK government uh, has stepped in uh, to help on the 2nd of July, the emergency loan to CELSA uh, in the steel industry was a very important uh, decision and has helped to safeguard 800 jobs here in South Wales. But that is an example of what more is needed. We absolutely have to have sectoral employment protection schemes for steel, for automotive uh, and for aerospace. Those are fundamental industries here uh, in Wales. They face existential crises as a result of coronavirus, uh, and each one of them needs a bespoke package of help from the UK government in order to make sure that they are here, the other side of this crisis, because the UK economy needs a steel industry. The UK economy needs a successful aerospace uh, industry. Uh, and only the UK government has the firepower, as my colleague Ken Skate has put it, to step in and provide help of the sort that is needed. The, the, U, the Welsh Government will continue to do the things that we do, investing in skills, investing in research, helping with local investments that we can uh, put uh, in place, as we have with Tata uh, in Port Talbot. But the nature of the crisis is such that it is a UK response that is needed, uh, and sadly, we didn't hear anything of it in the summer statement of Wednesday last week. Russell George. Uh, First Minister, yesterday's NatWest Business Activity uh, Index reported a uh, contraction in business activity in the manufacturing sector as a result of uh, ongoing lockdown measures. In their report, uh, they state that many businesses have reported that the ongoing lockdown measures have stymied growth opportunities. They also <coughs> report a drop in new orders, which was higher than the UK average, and a downturn in new business. They also go on to say that this weak client Demand has affected the manufacturing sector from hiring employees, uh, and this rate of contraction in employment has also outpaced, uh, sadly, the UK average. What assessment has the Welsh Government done on how the slower rate of reopening the economy has impacted livelihoods, and in particular, the Welsh manufacturing sector? Well, sorry, I don't think you need to do a great deal of analysis to understand that it is not the pace of Welsh economy lockdown lifting uh, that has had the effect on Airbus or on Tata. It's nonsensical to suggest it. Uh, those are global industries uh, and it is global trading conditions that have led to the decisions that those industries uh, are making. The pace of the lockdown in Wales has had no impact upon that whatsoever. And really it just doesn't stand up to any form of serious examples. No, the, the report doesn't suggest that. It's just a Tory gloss here trying to rescue some point, some point uh, that they think they can make rather than anything serious uh, at all. Uh, the, the crisis facing those industries, you have to wave it at me, uh, just because you've got it doesn't mean to say that you've understood it, does it? Uh, and clearly you haven't understood it. Because if you read what Airbus had to say, if you read what Tata have to say, they are not saying that the global crisis that they face has been derived from the pace at which the lockdown in Wales has been lifted. It would be absurd. It's an absurd proposition. The member should know better than to make it here. Question Chwech, Darren Miller. Uh, will the First Minister make a statement on Welsh Government support for the Armed Forces Covenant? Uh, thank Darren Miller for that question, Chloe. The Welsh Government's support for the Covenant was set out in the first annual report published in May of last year. 
It set out actions in housing, health, education and employment. Further progress will be outlined in this year's annual report to be laid before the Senate in September. Thank you for that answer, uh, First Minister. Over the past few months, we've seen our armed forces join the fight against the coronavirus here uh, in Wales, doing some exceptional work in terms of helping with testing facilities, uh, ensuring that there's adequate PPE delivered to key workers on the front line, uh, and of course, disinfecting ambulances in order to improve uh, turnaround uh, times. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that important role that the armed forces uh, has played in the crisis. One of the things which Wales has done extremely well, I think, uh, is to take forward the agenda of honouring the Armed Forces Covenant here uh, in, in Wales. And one of the key parts of the commitment that the Welsh Government has made, of course, has been the delivery and support for Armed Forces liaison officers uh, across the country. As you're aware, the funding for those posts comes to an end in March of next year, but I and many others in this chamber on a cross-party basis would like to see that support extended and those posts become permanent. Are you able to provide an update on the funding for those posts today? Uh, shall we thank uh, Darren Miller for that uh, further question? And I absolutely want to endorse what he has said about the exceptional work that we have seen in Wales from our liaison with the armed forces uh, in the coronavirus crisis. Uh, it's been a remarkable part of uh, the story of the last three months, the way in which we have been able to draw on the assistance uh, of armed force personnel. Uh, got used at one point to seeing a lot of people in fatigues uh, in Cate's Park in a way we've never uh, seen before. And uh, that help is now gradually uh, being withdrawn as the systems that uh, the military have helped us to put in place in Wales are there and are sustainable uh, into the future. So very pleased indeed to endorse what Darren Miller said there. Uh, with I, I wrote to the member on the 16th uh, of June promising him uh, an update on future funding for the Armed Forces Liaison Officers before the end of this term. Uh, and I'm very, very glad indeed therefore to be able to confirm uh, this afternoon, this morning rather, uh, that the Minister Heather Hannah Blyden has uh, made the decision to invest a further £275,000 uh, for each of the next two years from April uh, of 2021. And that is to sustain the very valuable work that Armed Forces Liaison Officers uh, have carried uh, out. I know uh, that this was uh, an idea very strongly supported by my colleague uh, Alan Davis when these posts were uh, created. And I know as well that Darren Miller has been a very strong supporter of the individuals in these posts. Uh, the individual uh, Armed Forces Liaison Officer for North Wales, uh, shall we, for example, has trained over 500 front frontline staff since coming uh, into post. And that has helped to raise awareness uh, of the Covenant uh, where this question started. And very glad, therefore, this afternoon, this morning, to be here. I'm so used to uh, being here in the afternoon, uh, the, this morning. Very pleased to confirm that those posts will remain funded by the Welsh Government beyond April of next year. Question Scythe, Michelle Brown. Uh, what assessment has been made of how restrictions in the health service put in place to contain the pandemic have impacted those needing the NHS for non-COVID-19 related reasons? Uh, so with exceptional measures have been needed to respond to the public health crisis we have faced in Wales. However, as the demand for coronavirus services reduces, non-COVID-19 services are resuming in all parts of the NHS. Thank you for that answer, First Minister. Uh, the restrictions placed on maternity services have been particularly difficult for new and expectant parents. Expectant mothers are being told that they must attend anomaly scans on their own and that even in the case of bad news, their partner can't be with them. Instead, they may be given written information they can go home with. Birthing partners are only allowed in once the mother has gone into established labour and then they have to leave shortly after the baby's born. They're not allowed then to visit again. Even picking up the partner a new baby involves waiting outside. And even if the baby needs to go into special care, only one parent is allowed in at, one, at a time to visit their newborn. This particularly cruel restriction is in direct contravention of the advice issued during the pandemic by the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health, who say, at such a stressful time, it's important for both parents to be able to be present together 
at least for part of the day. First Minister, similar restrictions have been lift, lifted elsewhere in the UK. Scotland did so on Monday, and their continuation here is causing anxiety to many parents to be. Can you tell worried expectant parents across Wales when these restrictions will be lifted so we can hopefully share the joys of bringing a new life into the world, but also be with each other if they have to go through any heartbreaking experiences? And on the off chance that they have been relaxed, why has no one told the expectant, concerns expectant mothers? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just missed the very end uh, of the question, but uh, the points that were made uh, in introducing the question are very real and important. Uh, all of us here will have heard from uh, parents looking forward to the birth of a child and uh, the, the additional uh, pressure and indeed distress that they face because of the way that uh, services have been provided during the crisis. Uh, but the answer as to why these restrictions have been in place is because of the particular vulnerability uh, of people uh, who are giving birth uh, and the vulnerability of the newborn uh, child. They've not been put in place for any reason other than to protect people's health. Uh, I can't give the member, I'm afraid, uh, a date in the way that she asks, because it won't be my decision. It will be the decision of clinicians, uh, because it is the people who are in charge of the health of the mother and the baby who make the decisions here uh, in Wales. And when they are ready, and they believe that it is safe to do so, then of course they will want to lift some of those restrictions, because nobody wants to see them continue uh, any longer than they need to. Finally, question eight, Trina Pjorworth. Will the First Minister make a statement on support for town and community councils during the... May I thank Trina Pjorworth. We are engaging with the sector to understand the pressures arising from COVID-19 to tackle problems as quickly as possible. A range of support has been provided through emergency regulations to enable councils to operate safely, effectively and lawfully while retaining the principles of openness and accountability. Thank you for that response. Holly Head Town Council has done its best over the years to improve facilities for the people of the town and the area, and one initiative that's been very successful is the reopening of the Empire Cinema. Like so many businesses, the Empire lost its income entirely because of the pandemic. The Council made a bid for funding from the Economic Resilience Fund, but that was rejected because the cinema was run by the council and wasn't a business entity in and of itself. This has created a major problem for the council. Cinemas will be allowed to open again in a few weeks' time, but I would like you to consider one thing. There will be a limitation on their ability to make money because they can't sell food and drink on the way in. That's one issue that I'd be grateful that if you were to look at. But more generally, I would like you to look at the rules that mean that a town council such as this had failed to access financial support, because I don't think it's fair that a town council like this one should be penalised for having tried to create an enterprise for its own people. So with my, uh... so with Hollyhead Town Council is not being penalised at all. They can access funding from government because they could apply for funding from the £78 million that we have given to the sector because the councils are losing income. And that fund is available, not just for the main local authorities, but also for a local council such as Hollyhead Town Council. And so the best advice for the council is to submit an application or a bid uh, for that money. We are aware of the situation that Hollyhead is facing because they've lost more than half the income that they distribute because uh, sorry less than half because of uh, in raising the precept so it's in a totally different situation to the vast majority of local councils but that fund is available to them and the best advice for them 
is to prepare a plan or a bid and submit that bid to see whether we can support them in that manner. I thank the First Minister. The next